music is in a different center of the brain. So when mom was suffering with Alzheimer's and she didn't remember anything, I could sing her a song like I was telling you earlier and she would sing along with me. One of those songs was one of her favorite songs because I was just like Bruce. Bruce was brought up in an Irish Catholic family and I was brought up in an Irish Catholic family. So mom, you know, loved this song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. So I would sing that to her and out of nowhere, she would just start belting out the lyrics, you know, not even missing a beat. Let me tell you what. She didn't remember. She didn't even know where she was or if it was day, night or what room she was in. But she could remember every line of that song and, and of the Herb Alberts, Alpert song and Johnny Mathis, you name it. It was it was pretty profound. And that that made me study a little bit about how Alzheimer's affects the brain and the music center of the brains in a different place. So it's quite interesting. So, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. Today, we are getting off the Bruce train, though I'm sure he will come up because he normally does. But I am talking to uh, Amber, who is a writer, soon to be podcaster, and already someone we have talked for 10 minutes before I hit record, and she is just the delight. Amber, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Jesse. This is fun. Yeah. So tell me, tell us a little about yourself. Well, I've had, I've had quite a diverse career. Uh, I was, and we'll get into some of this later, but, you know, I started off in the music business, uh, rather haphazardly, you know, I always, since I was a little kid, wanted to be in the music business in, in one regard or another, but the way that I got in, well, you'll find that pretty hilarious and fascinating at the same time. I'm also an author, a best-selling author uh, for my first book called Hiding from Myself. And I'm writing a second book now based on things that I did with, um, how do I say this? with a competition franchise that was one of the most popular franchises in America for a long time, uh, where people would get up and sing. And I helped people get over stage fright. And Mm -hmm. I'm writing a book. Um, The book is called Overcoming Stage Fright in a New York Minute. We all know a New York Minute, right? Yeah. Yeah. it's, It's kind of apropos for me to have that that title because I'm a New York girl. I came from New York and I did most of my songwriting in New York. And uh, a lot of the folks, I used to hang out in the theater district all the time. In fact, I dated someone in the theater district that was in Miss Saigon. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in my life back then. But, you know, as I got older, I I segued to um, being that of a producer, artist, mentor, um, And, you know, I kept writing for myself, you know, but early on, you know, I I did fairly well. I just, um, I just found out from my, my, uh, my publicist, uh, just when was it March? I think it was March that one of my songs surpassed 112 million listens, uh, plays. Really? Yeah. It took 20 years to do it though, (laughs) but it's, it was interesting. It was in. I did a lot of genres, right? I've right. country, pop country, um, dance, and smooth jazz. And okay. this one just happened to be smooth jazz and uh, played on the Weather Channel and all your hotels and obviously all of your, you know, Coles and Sears and Pennies and all those mm-hmm. places. So, um, you know, that was that was interesting. But my my most regarded accomplishment in my life has to be back in oh god 1999 no yeah maybe 1999 i was approached by someone in new york uh to help them out with an exhibit a museum exhibit 
Okay. And it was supposed to be for the children of Africa, particularly Ethiopia, where these girls particularly would travel across from their town to another town to get potable water. And they would walk back and forth 10 miles each way, each day. Like that's the only thing they would do all day is go get water, bring it back. It was still dirty when they got it back. So this exhibit was to bring advocacy to these, these unfortunate children. And I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm in. And well, you do realize it doesn't pay. I said, that's why I'm in. I don't want to be paid for this. So I was, I was in the, I was um, a music arranger for that one. And it was kind of funny because at first they wrote sort of a Luther Vandross R&B style track. It's kind of a little odd. I thought, you know, this is just not authentic to what we're looking to do. So long story short, I brought in some African drummers, um, which really, these guys are awesome from, from NYU and uh, some, some other people that I knew in the business and, and we redid the whole thing and we did it in, in the style that it was supposed to be. And I left the project and I didn't think another thing about it other than, well, that was wonderful. I'm glad. I hope they, whatever little, whatever little museum this goes in, I hope it, it makes a difference. Then I find out about a year later, <laughs> he, like one of the guys calls me up and he says, it's still on the road. I said, what's still on the road? Well, the exhibit it's, it's currently traveled to 154 countries. I said, really? Wow. And I just hope you don't get upset, but we did include you in a documentary and, you know, gave you credit. I said, well, that's beautiful. Thank you. You need to do that. And he says, well, I just wanted to inform you that as of September, this is going back, oh my God, 20 years. Yeah. It's going to have a permanent residence in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. <gasps> so I was like, floored i was so that was to me that's something you pass along to your kids and say this is what you aspire to do the other stuff is just gravy on the cake you know on the icing on the cake if you will but yeah you know it's those stories that are the ones that really touch you you know like you hope you made a difference you know i i went to dinner with um and and i'm drawing a blank on joe's last name uh but um he was the producer of Comic News Insider podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Joe was in town in Dallas for business. And we went to we went to dinner and he had kind of had started this charity that was all about just getting fresh water to countries that needed it towns cities you know and you know and and you know digging wells and getting fresh water and we were at a tex Tex tex-mex restaurant and he said you know he held up his glass he says this is magic in the right now he says as as often as i want they're going to refill this glass of water just I can drink it and they will magically come bring me more water in this restaurant. He says, and so I try to only drink one glass, kind of a reminder of myself. Um, and you think about these kind of stories that we take it for granted, right? That we we go to the fountain, we turn the faucet or um, we grab a bottle of, uh, you know, bottled water or, you know, my refrigerator has a filter and I get water and it's just a miracle that, it is. you know, that we happen and we just take, we take for granted. I worked for a company that actually invented Life Straw. I, I didn't work for the company that invented Life Straw, but I worked with a company that helped them partner with other people. And wow, what an amazing thing. Do you know Life Straw? uh tell me remind me just it's I think basically I a little it's like a little it's like a metal straw and mm-hmm. you can put it in the muddiest water you could put it in a puddle and drink the puddle it's so amazing it it, it immediately changes you know um basically undrinkable water into drinkable water for those wow. people that are really suffering it's amazing i i still i still have a few of them in in my dresser uh just as a keepsake, you know, for that yeah. God, you know, God be with us, you know, that 
we don't need to use that sort of stuff. Sure. There are, you know, countless millions of people around the world that have to use stuff like that. Yeah. 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 So let's go back. We're going to jump in the DeLorean, the TARDIS, the time tunnel, Wayback <laughs> Machine. Talk about, yeah. you said you are a New York girl. So I take yeah. it you grew up in New York. Talk about what kind of music did your family listen to? Well, I grew up in a very small town. Okay. And the town was based on the movie Dirty Dancing. So Dirty Dancing was based on my town. Gross Singers Hotel and you know, uh, you know, the Kellerman's, all that stuff that you see yes. in the movie is really based on all of that stuff from my, the county I lived in. And, and I always tell people there were more deer than people there. So <laughs> we didn't, we didn't really have a whole lot of, you know, pizzazz up there when it came to that, because those days, those heydays were well gone by the time I was born, but the music we listened to you know, dad wasn't so much an audiophile, but mom certainly was. She loved John Lennon, um, adored Johnny Mathis, but her favorite, her absolute favorite was Herb Alpert in the Tijuana Brass, especially that song, This Guy's in Love With You. And she used to listen to these songs over and over again when I was a kid. And interesting story, um, being that I knew, I was so close with mom and I was there when she passed and she died of Alzheimer's very young. And while I was next to her, as she was, you know, minutes away from passing, I was actually singing and playing the song, this guy's in love with you. And I said, mom, you know, when you, you know, just don't be afraid. I'm already there with you, sweetheart. I'm there right now. And me and Herb, we're going to give you a big hug. And what I did is I had never met Herb. Okay. In all the years I've been doing this, I never met him. Mom died a month later. I found out where he was going to be. And Herb is up there now. He's, he's, I think, 82 now. Okay. And, you know, but he still performs and he's rock solid still with everything he does. And most people don't know this about him. He's also an, an unbelievable sculptor. Oh, and I did not know that. Okay. He he lives out. Yeah. He lives out in California, has a beautiful um, ranch out there and all these sculptures that he's made. And what's interesting about Herb is that he still performs just as good as he did when he was younger. And, and his wife is with him. And, and um, of course she's a, a vocalist and she was in, she was the lead singer of, of, of that bond movie. Um, uh, I'm trying to blank. Um, but anyway, you know, I called his manager and I said, Xander, listen, oops, I just gave his name away. Um, I'm going to be in Clearwater, Florida on X date. And I'd really love to, you know, have, have a, have a little conversation with her. And he says, who are you? <laughs> so I had to sort of give him and his assistant, you know, my credentials of who I was and that I'm not just some crazy fan. And he said, sure, you know, listen, Herb doesn't do meet and greets anymore. You know, he's tired after his show. And I said, I completely understand that. He says, but tell you what, you know, call me after the show and I'll let you upstairs and you guys can hang out. Maybe do you like pizza? I said, well, yeah, I've, I've done the after show stuff a million times. So yeah, I'm sure he's having pizza. So I go up there, I'm sitting in the room with the drummer and he walks in. And he's the only human being out of the hundreds of celebrities I've met. He's the only one I've ever gotten starstruck by. Wow. He is a self-made billionaire. Yes. Because he is A&M Records. He's the A in A&M Records, which was obviously the largest record company for decades, right? So uh, here I am standing in front of him and, and I'm, I'm tongue-tied. I didn't know what to say to him. I said, oh my God. God. Um, so I, I just said, I'm so happy to meet you finally. And he says, Oh, so what did you do in the music business? We talked a little business for a few minutes. And then I segued into my mother with Alzheimer's. He immediately got emotional because his wife's mother, you know, um, was affected. I don't want to say too much because that's private stuff, but you know, there was a, there was a, this conversation that came out of nowhere unscripted that sort of led to this long conversation about families and the devastating effects of Alzheimer's disease. And it was just a wonderful moment that I got to share uh, and, 
and I knew somehow, some way in this universe that mom was able to understand what, what had just transpired, you know, for her, I wouldn't have gone out of my way to meet him. Otherwise it's too complicated with some people. Sure. Um, but that was, that was a thing for me. So when I was younger, you know, those were the songs we used to listen to, but me, I had a whole different taste. Let me tell you, Greased had just come out. So I loved Olivia Newton, John, right. She was like my favorite ever. Um, but I also liked, I also liked a lot of artists that were people that used to tease them. Like my friends used to say, you like Carly Simon? I said, I love Carly Simon. And the, the, the one artist that is my all-time favorite is Karen Carpenter. Yes. Karen Carpenter was a drummer. And that's how I became a drummer. She was, she was my influence to become a drummer. And uh, I just loved the drums my whole life. So I became a drummer because of Karen Carpenter and, and, you know, oh, what a mom, voice. Such oh a beautiful my God, voice. there's just nobody, uh, there's yeah. nobody, there's this one TikTok girl that I, I befriended that is really spot on. She mm -hmm. sounds identical. It's just amazing. I've never heard anything like it, but you know, Karen Carpenter and the Bee Gees, I loved the Bee Gees, everything about the Bee Gees just totally was was with me there until you hit the 80s of course and then <laughs> everything changed right? right you know then it's pat benatar and madonna and you know all those folks but um yeah that was that was the family sort of interest in music back then um so amber have you ever had a chance to watch the netflix special that bruce did of on him on broadway I did not. Okay, no. so so they filmed his scene on Broadway, um, and the he does a song called "The Wish," uh, which is about his mother, and um, there's a um, and he talks about her having Alzheimer's, and how that she still they keep music playing because she she still her eyes light up when there's music playing and so uh the whole thing is beautiful but um i definitely recommend you checking it out because he talks about that um and the the song is all about his mom and how um you know she gave him his first guitar and how all the joy that guitar has brought them and the success. So it's, it's worth checking out, especially. Oh, yeah, I would absolutely check that out. And I know yeah. that, you know, music is in a different center of the brain. So when mom was suffering with Alzheimer's and she didn't remember anything, I could sing her a song. Yeah. Like I was telling you earlier and she would sing along with me. One of those songs was one of her favorite songs because I was just like Bruce. Bruce was brought up in an Irish Catholic family, right. right? And I was brought up in an Irish Catholic family. So mom, you know, loved this song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Yeah. So I would sing that to her. And out of nowhere, she would just start belting out the lyrics, you know, not even missing a beat. Let me mm -hmm. tell you what. She didn't remember. She didn't even know where she was or if it was day, night or what room she was in. But yeah, she could remember every line of that song and, and of the Herb Alberts, Alpert song and, you know, um, Johnny Mathis, you name it. It was it was pretty profound. And that that made me study a little bit about how Alzheimer's affects the brain and the music center of the brains in a different place. So it's quite interesting. So, yeah, thanks for that. I will. Oh, good. Absolutely, look the wish up. Absolutely. Uh, so, as you're, um, you know, you're you're finding your own musical roots, and you're going through the '80s. Yeah. When when did you decide you wanted to try to break into the music business? When I was four. Oh, that long, huh? Yeah. I mean, I when I was little, um, when I was five years old, I guess I would have to say almost five, because when I was five, I was 80% deaf. Then by the middle of age five, I was 92% deaf. They said I couldn't hear anything anymore. I had a congenital defect. I had to go to the children's hospital in New York city and have operations done. Um, and then later in life, I found out that 
during one of those operations, I didn't make it. They had to bring me back. It was sort of spooky. Um, I didn't learn that until I was actually like 30 years old. It was, I was like, you didn't, you never told me this. They said, of course we didn't tell you this. It's too freaky. Um, so yeah, I got my hearing back. Uh, and, and then I ended up with something called perfect pitch. It's been profound. I can, I can, that's, that's why I was doing some basic vocal coaching and all this other stuff during the whole thing is my sister took classical piano lessons at a young age and she would leave the room frustrated after banging on the keys, not being able to play the song. And I would walk in and I would start playing the song and I didn't know how to play the piano. Now this is going to maybe nine years old, 10 years old. Yeah. And my mom would go, Oh, Colleen, that's beautiful. And she walks in the room. She goes, where's your sister? I said, upstairs. She goes, no, 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 no. She just finished that song beautifully. Get her back down here. I said, no, I did it. She goes, no, you didn't. And I put my fingers on the keys. I did the song again. She goes, oh my God, what is going on? So yeah, I was really young when I wanted to do this. And Mm -hmm. I joined the band in high school. I joined jazz band, marching band, orchestra, any band I could get. And by the time I was 13, I had my own synthesizers in my room and my own drum set, which, which I got incidentally from my uncle, who was a professional drummer at eight years old. He gave that to me. You should have seen this thing around me. It was so big and I was so little and it's just, it was a joke almost because I could barely reach the pedal. And, but I learned and, and I taught myself piano. I didn't even hold my fingers the correct way on the piano at first. And I started writing songs, you know, by the time I was eight years old, I had written five or six songs already. And, um, as a teenager, I locked myself in the room and just did it. You know, Amber, I, I always find this interesting. And, and, um, I, I, I have a good friend named Tom Zoller that is an artist and he, he talks about, that all he ever wanted to do was create art. I mean, from the moment he could pick up a crayon, he knew that's what he wanted to do. And yeah. I recently had um, Sarah Hickman on the fo- on the podcast, and we had gotten to be friends over the years. Um, she was with Electra for a while and mm-hmm. is just a very successful singer songwriter uh, locally. And and she talked about she always she always knew she wanted to perform i mean she could she's you know like she cannot remember a time she didn't write songs and then other people i talked to amber will say it wasn't till they were they hit their teenage years and others like in their middle 20s or even 30s before they went oh i i think i want to be creative so I, um, I love that diversity that some <laughs> yeah. people find this, this, their uh, creative, you know, inspiration later in life. Um, I think that's amazing. You just have always known. So this is something you knew you wanted to do. Um, did you go to school? Did you go to college? Did you? Um... I did go to college, not for music though. Okay. And, but... and interestingly enough, I... I was going to go for computer science in RIT in Rochester, New York. And I had just finished the, what do you call that? The the orientation, right? And they took me into these, these clean rooms where you had to put on a white suit and see the microchips and all that stuff. And I was like, so fascinated with all that stuff. And I got a call from our, my manager at that time. And he said, so what are you doing right now? I said, I'm on a tour at a college in Rochester. <laughs> he says, I happen to be in Rochester right now. Can you meet in about two hours? I said, why? He goes, I have something incredible to tell you. I met him and he said, how would you like to go on tour for the next two years? You know, doing this stuff. And I was like, you're kidding me. No. So I didn't go on tour one thing led to another and I I joined a local band and this local band uh, was also handled with management and we each traveled all around 
playing gigs, I was making more money with them back then than a lot of times in my whole adult life <laughs> believe it or not there's something called starving musician yes and i certainly wasn't with that group that we were doing we were pulling it in and were you were you drumming were you there i was i was drumming believe it or not i was singing drumming and playing um alternative keyboard tracks and controlling a sequencer all at the same time wow if you looked at my setup it, uh, if you, all right, so Def Leppard, right? Yeah, you remember his Simmons set, mm -hmm. right? So I had that set when we started gigging, and then I moved on to a something called D Drum, and I had that set up behind me. I had the keyboards set up, so I would be drumming with one hand, <laughs> sort mm -hmm. of like he was, and I would be playing a bass line with my other hand and singing the background vocals. We had a really great vocalist uh that did all the leads i was not a lead vocalist um for maybe i don't know 12 songs that's all and um mostly because i was behind the drums and you know we want the front person to be singing and um so that that was a hoot i have to tell you uh and then it was shortly after that that i actually got my break into the music business i by pure absolute happenstance i think this is probably going to be your next question like how did i get into the business yes exactly yeah probably so a good, go it's forward. probably a good segue. segue absolutely i was in new york city in a songwriters convention at the hilton hotel and i got there a couple hours early okay i was from the catskills i didn't know new york city very well so i was like i better get there early so what did i do i got there two hours early <laughs> like an idiot yes you get in there and there's nothing open so the, the, the ballroom was closed. It was locked. No, not even security was there yet. So about 45 minutes before their opening, security's unlocking the door. He sees me sitting there all by myself. He says, listen, are, are you going to this conference? I said, yeah. He says, bet you're hungry, aren't you? I said, yeah, a little bit. And yeah. he goes, why don't you come on in? Am I allowed? Well, no, but come on in. You're, you're all by yourself. And then you know what? That line's going to get crazy long because there's about 1,200 people going to be here in about a half hour so i walked in with him i put my my i, I brought four <laughs> this is gonna date me oh my god i brought four cassette tapes with me with my packets and sat it down on the front seat right. of this conference next to the stage at yeah. the front of the room and then i proceeded to walk all the way to the back of the room to this long table that had this incredible spread from every type of New York bagel. And honey, if you're not from New York and you don't know what a real New York bagel is, you need to have one once in your life, right? Absolutely. All the best New York bagels were there. Orange juice, coffee of every type, and you name it was there. So I'm sitting there looking at all these bagels and this woman walks up behind me and she goes, it's a bitch, isn't it? I said, yeah, I can't, I can't pick the right bagel. She goes, what's your favorite? I said, salt she goes good choice go for it let's you and me get a salt bagel so i don't know who she is so we both get a salt bagel we're slathering the cream cheese on it and and getting our coffee and she goes where are you from hun i said well i'm from you know upstate new york she goes oh you're not from the city i said no no she goes where i said you probably didn't never heard of it the catskills liberty new york she goes, oh, Liberty, New York. Yes, I've been there several times. Gross Singers Hotel and blah. Now I'm like, wow, who is this lady? How does she know all this stuff? So I keep talking to her and she goes, so you're a songwriter? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, that's great. Um, so I segue back to the bagels for some reason, because I have absolutely no idea who she is. Right. She's, she's an older woman, first of all. And so we're eating when we're doing this stuff and we're just talking about life. We're not talking about music. I'm not giving her my wants and needs and she's not telling me anything. And at the end of the conversation, she goes, listen, why don't you give me one of your packets? And I promise you Monday morning, no matter if I like it or not, I will give you a personal phone call. Would you like that? I said, really? She goes, I think you're adorable and I want to do this for you. Now, 
when she said that, I smiled, the biggest smile, but inside I was crying. I was dying. I was like, I've only brought four cassettes with me and I'm about to give one of them to this lady. I don't know. Who, you that know. I have no idea who oh, it is. Yes. Man, I was like, damn it. My luck. Right. So I give her one of them. And as soon as I hand it to her, this other girl, this young girl wearing a headset comes up to her and she goes, Anne, we got to go. We got to get you mic'd up. Your keynote is in about 10 minutes. Now I'm looking around the room as we had been talking for the past 20 minutes, the whole room filled in. There was easily 1200 people in the room. And I'm like, keynote, she has to give the keynote. So Mm -hmm. she goes, it was nice to meet you. Take care. And I promise I'll call you Monday. I said, thank you. I went to sit down. This, this gentleman was sitting next to me. He goes, how did you get Ann Rucker to take your tape? I said, I didn't give it to her. She asked for it. He goes, oh, bullshit. I said, serious. I swear to God. She goes, you are the luckiest person in this whole room. I said, why? Boom. The lights come on. Somebody from ASCAP comes out and he says, this is a woman that certainly needs no introduction except for me. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And I still had no freaking idea who she was. And he goes, well, I'm going to tell you anyway, she's worked with Barbara Streisand, Aretha Franklin, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson, Madonna, and started naming the who's who of everything. And she is currently the vice president on the board of the Grammy Awards. And I'm like, oh, my God, I just gave my packet to the freaking vice president of the Grammy Awards, not to mention she's worked with everyone. Sure. And and I present to you, Miss Ann Ruckard you know, the, the, the staple of the music industry. And I'm like, Whoa, nobody's going to believe this. And she called me Monday that next Monday, she called me and she said, honey, one of the three songs is great. I'm just going to lay it on you. I didn't care for the other two, but that one super, 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 I need to get you down here. When can you come down to New York? I said, right now. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So Here's the way it really went down, though. I still lived at home with mom and dad. I was like 20 years old or so. And she called our answering machine. They don't pick up the phone at mom and dad's house. They just let it go to that answering machine. For the younger people, I'm not even going to explain what an answering machine is, all right? So look it up. (laughs) So they call me at work and they said, listen, honey, you need to listen to this. And I listen and it's Anne. Hi, this is Ann Record calling. We met at the new music seminar and I told you I'd give you a call. I listened to your tracks. Please call me back at 212, blah, 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 blah. I dropped the phone. I did not tell my boss where I was going. I completely left work and, and went home, listened to the message 10 more times before I got the energy and the courage to call her back. And she she answered the phone. She, his, her secretary answered, said, Miss Record is busy right now. Can I ask who's calling? I said, you know, she called me. It's not that I'm calling her. And she goes, oh, 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 I recognize what's going on here. Hold on, hold on. Just give me a second. She goes to get Ann. Ann gets on the phone. We have this nice, beautiful 10 minute conversation. And within two weeks, I am in New York City at D&D Recording. Now, do you know D&D Recording? They mixed down Madonna's Like a Prayer album. Okay. My first gig, I guess, was to sit in this recording studio while they mixed down the Like a Prayer album for Madonna. It was me, a recording engineer, two producers, some other person I can't name, and me. Oh, and some guy tapping on an octopad every so often because he was making a dance track out of it as well. And I was just so floored. I was like, wow, this is my first introduction to all this. And from there, it just, you know, it, she was such a wonderful person. She, she died a few years ago. God bless her. Um, but boy, she was an inspiration to me and an what unlikely a, one, you know. What a wonderful mentor. Oh, my I God. I just got she started on the path. Yeah. And she was a vocal coach right? Mm-hmm. She, she was the vocal coach to the stars. And she, I think she amassed over 3000 or it could be 30,000 different recordings yeah. on albums that she had done in her lifetime. And it's just such an amazing, her, her life is an amazing journey and story. And she's helped so many people. And um, I tell everybody, I owe it to her. I mean, I wouldn't have met half the people in, in, 
in there if it wasn't for her. In 1993, you know, 1993, I did the new music seminar as an agent of the new music seminar. Right. right. So I was actually working for them at that point. And we were in New York City and I was running the Palladium. And in the Palladium, we had a lot of acts going on. Right. And one of them was a new group called Blue Man Group. Now, they had been around for a couple of years, but they weren't big time. I was there the night they were discovered. Right. So that was kind of an interesting thing. But the night after that, I was at the conference center. I think it was either the Javits Center or it might have been a hotel. I don't even remember anymore. But I was I was hanging out in there doing, you know, getting people where they need to go because it was a showcasing conference. People would showcase at these different venues and they would either get signed or get sent along their way. And lo and behold, in walks Atrell Cordez. Now, you may not know that name right away. But if you ever heard the band or the group PM Dawn, you know, from, from the, the late 80s, early 90s, PM Dawn, um, he was the, the lead singer and the writer for, for them. And I hung out with him for a few hours and I'm, I'm having just a wonderful time talking to him. He was such a sweetheart. And of course, you know, tragically, a couple of years, diabetes took him from us. Um, but here I was with him and he says, why don't you go to dinner with us? You know, we, I'd, I'd love to talk to you some more. You're so fascinating to talk to. I just want to, you know, tell you how we do our stuff. Cause he was telling me how he samples George Michael music or Spandau ballet music, because of course their songs were based on those and how they buy the copyright out on it and, and create these really pop oriented rap music um, songs. And I was like, Oh, I can't. My manager has invited me to go to dinner with this guy, John, and, and I can't do it and I can't get out of it. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> this is the funniest, most hilarious thing ever. Talk about being at the right place at the right time. I go out to dinner with her. She introduces me to John. So there's her, my other boss, this other guy, and John sitting at a table in a very expensive restaurant in New York. John had just signed a major, a major recording deal for his own TV show. Now, I only knew John as an MTV music guy, music jock guy. Yeah. Didn't know anything else about him, except he was funny as hell. He was really funny. And at the end of the conversation, he told us about the contract and that he had just literally signed it. We're at dinner after he literally signed this contract. Mm -hmm. The person I'm talking about is John Stewart from the John Stewart show. <laughs> How funny. Unreal. Like, you know, I was just getting my, I was just still getting my roots in. And I just happened to meet all these people at the right time. And you start mingling. Once you get in, you start mingling everywhere. And if you're a gabber like me, obviously, you know, I'm a gabber. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, thanks. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, that's a good thing. <laughs> is that a is a good thing. thing. I, I, there are, I, I had someone um, on the podcast <laughs> this weekend. And he said before he got on his wife said, now don't tell too many stories. And I go, no, no, no. Ignore your <laughs> lovely bride's advice. No, telling stories is a good thing when you're doing a podcast. Yeah. So I was like, John Stewart, you know, it didn't mean anything to me back then because he was funny. I knew him from MTV, but he wasn't like a super celebrity. And, you know, who knew that he would have the longest running show, The Daily Show, you know, in history. That That's just an amazing thing to me. And then from there, I went on to work on the 25th Woodstock reunion and worked with people like, oh, God, Stevie Nicks and Don Henley, Reben McIntyre, the Goo Goo Dolls, Third Eye Blind. I don't even remember who else was there. Richie Havens, of course. Joni Mitchell was there. I didn't meet her. Um, Ziggy Marley, <laughs> he was cool. Um, and Randy Travis, the sweetest guy uh, I've I've ever gotten to know. Um, you know that stroke really devastated him, and then he got aphasia, which stops you from singing, of course. But yeah, what a great human being he is, and uh, you know. It's through that that I ended up moving to Nashville for a few years to to pursue music there. And, you know, doing music in Nashville, um, 
the way in there was through a guy named Brett Manning. Brett Manning is Taylor Swift's vocal coach. Okay. He's also Keith Urban's vocal coach. Um, and, you know, he's, he's done Miley Cyrus. Uh, one of my favorites was Haley Williams of Paramore. Um, okay. She was doing the Twilight song, uh, learning how to do that while I was there. So, you know, when you're doing a session with Brett, you know, you're in his three-story mansion and you're on the top floor in the studio section and it's just this gorgeous place and and all these folks are coming in and out like you know and and you're just part of these people that are coming in and out that's how you get to meet people like keith urban or taylor swift or any of those folks and she was still doing country back then yeah and um and then i happened to got i got lucky and met jeffrey Steele, who wrote all of the hit songs for rascal flats oh Um, nice you know, he wrote songs like These Days, My Wish, What Hurts the Most, um, you know, for Tim McGraw, The Cowboy and Me, all those great songs. When the Lights Go Down by Faith Hill, like that, mm. that was a great song. Um, and, you know, all of those things were really, to me, um, things that inspired me to to write differently. Because in Nashville, it's such a small click. And these uh-huh. people in the small click stick together. And, and, and they all know each other's business, kind of. But at the same time, they're like a family. And once you're in, you're in. Yeah. So I started writing this one song called If I Leave. And it was sort of a country crossover song. And I happen to know the guys at American Idol. The, you know, the, the uh, band during a live show. Sure. So I happen to know some of those guys and I had them perform the, the uh, instrument tracks on this song. I had first performed the instrument tracks. I, I charted the whole guitar solo and the, all that stuff. And I shipped it to them. And within a day, they like got it back to me in New York. And I had my vocalist sing it. We mastered it in it back in LA. It was very complicated. It was back and forth, New York to LA to back, and at the end of the day, the, the one guy says, who was also a producer, says to me, you should send this to the UK. Now, to me at that time, here I was in Nashville thinking, why don't I give it to one of the record companies here? And he says, send it to the UK. And I said, all right, that's a death wish. They hate this freaking song. I'm just not going to make a big huff over it. So I send it to the UK just as a joke. In the UK, within six weeks, it went number one on the independent charts. And I was like, you've got to be shitting me. Wow. <laughs> Am I allowed to say shit? Yes, you are. Because <laughs> it, it, I, I was tripping at that point. I, I could not believe that you know, was, here I was. What's the it's name called, of the song? It's called If I Leave. And the artist was Mandy Miller. Um, you can look at the demo reel on my youtube page if okay you like. if you just type in if i leave mandy miller you'll 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 see and hear the song and you'll hear you know the the audio the um, musical instruments the drummer and the guitar player the bassist all those folks they were all from the american idol band that i knew and um so that was that was an interesting segue that got me into more uh, of of concert stuff that's yeah. where my concert life really began and, you know, let me tell you something, when you get in front of 5,000 people, it's a trip. Actually, when you get in front of 500 people, it's a trip. Sure. Get in front of 5,000 people. It's a big trip. Yes. Like, I it's, can a, imagine. it's electric. Get yeah. in front of 25,000 people and say, how's everyone doing? Cause they made me do that with the radio station. And let me tell you something. It, it was beyond electric. It just, when they all scream back at you. It's like nothing you've ever felt. And some people would freeze up. They'd get amygdala hijacking and just, I can't do this. And some of the radio disc jockeys actually were like that. I had one radio disc jockey during a show backstage, you know, chugging a fifth of Jack Daniels. And he, Uh he, he says, you know, I know this is sort of unsanitary, but would you like a little sip pun? And I said, Oh no, 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 no. I don't, I I don't ever do anything. I was in the music business for 28 years and never did drugs. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of that. You know, you should be. Um, And, you know, 
this guy got loaded before he went out. And the funny story was it was for, um, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> it was for Josh Turner. Do you remember him? Yes. Yes. So a uh, Josh Turner, um, who I got to know pretty well too. He, it was at one of his concerts and the guy from this radio station in upstate New York um, in the Westchester County area, I think it was WRWD or one of those stations. No, no, no. I don't even remember the call letters. It wasn't that one. It was another one. Okay. This one was closer to New York city because they had about three and a half million listeners. And I said, why do you need to do this? You got three and a half million listeners every day listening to you. He goes, you don't understand. I'm in a studio. I see a wall. I see a window that somebody passes every so often and my microphone. Yeah. I don't sit in front of the actual audience, you know? So the audience is 3 million people and it doesn't bother you when you're in a studio. I said, I totally get you. Wow. Yeah. So he comes out there and I announce everyone. Right. Right. And then I announce him and he comes running out full steam with the, with the people with the, the t-shirt, you know, shotguns or whatever they are that shoot the sheet, the, the, the t-shirts and as he's running he trips over some wires that were not in the right place falls flat on his face the entire crowd erupts in laughter and i said you know this is this is who we get always a comedian he didn't trip on anything honey you ain't fooling anybody get on up here and do your show and he thanked me afterwards because that is awesome yeah amber and i continued talking but instead of us having a hour and a half episode, I'm splitting this up in two. Come back tomorrow and we hear about her book and her podcast she's working on. Doing a podcast at times can be a one-way conversation, and I hate that. So please let me know what you like and don't like about the work I'm doing. You can reach the podcast via email at setlustingbruce at gmail.com. The show is on Twitter at setlustingbruce, and my personal Twitter is at Jesse Jackson DFW. We have a website, www.setlustingbruce.com. From there, you can find links to other Springsteen podcasts as well as other music themed podcasts. We have a page devoted to our own SLB All Star Band. These are guests who have been on the podcast more than three times. There is a link to our store where you can purchase Set Lessing Brew shirts, as well as a Mary Question t-shirt. There is a link to our Patreon page where you can sign up to help support the podcast financially. We have different levels and different rewards based on your support. If you don't have any extra cash, and right now who does, you can support the podcast by subscribing via your favorite podcast player and leaving us a review. The more reviews we have, the easier it is for people to find us. And please tell a friend about the podcast, especially if they love Bruce or music, because it will make a difference. You just heard the fun talking, hard rocking, music loving, album ranking, fan thinking, joy spreading, lyric reading, story sharing podcast that is the one the only set listing Bruce. The theme for set listing Bruce was written by David Rosen, used by permission.